cross has been gone into Christian churches without people realizing what it means. It's the same symbol, the cross and the circle. And again, you see the same symbol here. This is the uh, famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a very high initiate. In fact, he was the grand master of an uh, elite secret society, still very much uh, part of the manipulation today, called the Priory of Sion, S-I-O-N. And Sion comes from a Sanskrit word meaning the sun. The Priory of the Sun is what he's actually saying. And this guy was an initiate who, un who, who knew the underground story and the underground knowledge. This is why da Vinci was able to um, make predictions and draw pictures of, of various technologies that were well ahead of his time. Now what he's done here is present the Last Supper picture in the form of symbolizing that same symbol, the cross and uh, the sun on the middle and the circle. He's depicted Jesus as the sun, hence the halo around his head there, and he's broken up the disciples into four sets of three, symbolizing the three-month periods uh, of the seasons and the sun going through them. This is why this constant recurring number of 12 and 1, the hero and the 12 followers, constantly reoccurs. This is why you have King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the table, the circle of the Zodiac. This is why again and again the big religious heroes had 12 followers, the sun and the months and the areas of the Zodiac. This is an ancient um, stone depiction of the Phoenician and many other uh, cultures within the Middle Near East, but certainly the Phoenician sun god called Bel or Bill, who became the Canaanite Baal. And there you see the halo around the top of his head symbolizing the sun. And this is vastly ahead of the emergence of Christianity, which then used the halo because the same uh, symbolism was used because, again, is Zor Zoroaster depicted with the, the halo and the rays around his head because these guys did not actually exist. They were symbols of the sun. That level of knowledge knows that. This level of knowledge, the masses, takes the symbolic literal and you have a prison religion. So let's um, pick up how this all unfolded from here. Just to quickly summarize, in that area of what we now call Iran, Turkey, and the Caucasus Mountains, you had two advanced races at the same time. You had the Martian race, which came down and uh, survived there and, and came out of there um, after the cataclysm involving Venus 7,000 years ago or so. But you also had um, another race, which the Sumerian text called the Anunnaki, a reptilian race. And they interbred in this uh, program or programs that are described in the Sumerian texts. Um, and interestingly, they describe how this Anunnaki did this um, interbreeding by using what we would call test tube methods. Now, of course, when these tablets were found in 1850, the idea of creating life in test tubes, utterly ludicrous, no longer. And so you had the interbreeding between the white race, the Martian race, and the Anunnaki. And the outcome of that was what appeared to be a human form, is what we'll call it today. But within that white race were particular bloodlines that were very, very reptilian. And again, you have to look in detail in The Biggest Secret to see the enormous documentation of this. But it's these bloodlines, this particularly the white reptilian, the Anunnaki Martian bloodlines, that actually have run the world ever since. Demonstrably, the white race took the world over. They came out of the Caucasus Mountains and this area of the world in two basic ways. Go one way first, by land. They came out of the Caucasus Mountains. And incidentally, what do Americans call white people? Caucasian. Why do they call them after some mountains in the Near East? Because that's where the white race came from. They came across land into Europe 
and they changed their names. They were the Scythians, they were the Sumerians, they were many different names. And if you follow the movement of people, you find that they became the white race of Europe. They became the Anglo-Saxon race because the Angles and the Saxons were simply different names for the same race. They became the Scandinavian peoples, they became the British, and they became the French. They became the European white race. And within this white race were these Anunnaki bloodlines, these reptilian bloodlines. And these were the ones, when you do the research and the genealogy, that ended up again and again and again in the positions of power. Uh, political, royal, uh, economic, all of it. And so, um, not only did they come across land in that way, much earlier, around 3000 BC, through a white race called the Phoenicians, they went by sea to Britain. And what we call the British culture, which of course has, has, has had such an effect on passing on that culture to the rest of the world, is actually the Phoenician culture. It comes from the Near East. And the proof of that is endless in the artifacts and the legends and the stories that have been uh, left. For instance, what you see there um, in that depiction on the coin, a ancient coin, is a Phoenician goddess called Bharati. And on the other side, you see the classic depiction by the British of their goddess, Britannia. And they are the same, because Britannia was Bharati. The Phoenicians uh, worshipped uh, two uh, deities. One was the male, Barat, one was the female, Bharati. And she became Britannia, and Barat and Bharati became Baritan, and the Baritish. The British culture is, in effect, the Phoenician culture. Not only that, when you look at the names given to the goddesses and what have you, or in the Indus Valley, what we call the Hindu culture, they are the same. They are very, very close to the name Bharat and Bharati because this white race, as I said earlier, also went in and created the Indus Valley Hindu culture. No accident that all the major religions in the world that were prisoners came out of this same area of the Middle and Near East. In Britain are white horses scored into the hillside. This is the supposed to be the oldest one. It's a place called Uffington in Wiltshire. And it's been dated to around 3000 BC. That is precisely the time the Phoenicians arrived by sea into Britain, bringing the Bharati, Baritish culture as it became. Now, why would the Phoenicians score horses in the hillsides, the chalk hillsides of Britain? Very simple. The Phoenicians were sun worshippers. This was a Phoenician symbol of the sun. Um, this is a Phoenician uh, high priestess. Again, you see the swastika. The swastika was a Phoenician symbol of the sun. Quite a positive symbol, and what the Nazis did, because they understood this, is they turned it round to indicate the negative, because they understood the uh, nature of the sun as well. This is a Phoenician stone found in Britain. There again, you see the um, swastika. And what we call the British culture came from the Near East. Another thing that these advanced people within the Phoenician culture uh, understood was the fact that the earth uh, has uh, through it and around it uh, what is known as an energy grid or grids. These are force lines of energy. Some people call them ley lines, some people call them dragon lines in China, meridians, whatever. Where these lines of force cross, you create a vortex. Where many of these lines cross, you create a colossal vortex. And therefore, you have enormous energy which you can use to create and do various things. This guy um, was an Englishman in a place called Herefordshire. And one day, he was on his horse at the top of a hillside, and he suddenly looked down into the valley and saw these lines in a sort of psychic way all over the place, straight lines, and they connected the sacred wells, the sacred places of worship, the points where the churches were built, the, the hillsides, etc. 
And this now, as we have moved on, has been um, confirmed by...